Okay, so today's lecture builds on where I left off last time with multiple alignment, um, and we're going to focus on motifs. There are a lot of individual new concepts here. Uh, it's a pretty dense lecture, so if I'm going too quickly or you're not feeling comfortable with something, let's try and you know get into it and ask questions as it comes up rather than sitting there feeling lost, all right? So the things I want to cover pretty, pretty ambitiously today are restriction sites, which are really simple patterns, gene finding, I'm only going to go into that sort of at a cursory level, regulatory sites in DNA, like transcription factor binding sites, protein signals, like relatively simple patterns in protein sequences, and then protein functional domains and motifs. Regular expressions, which is a way of looking for patterns. Uh, position specific scoring matrices, which relates directly to what I was talking about last week with the multiple alignment methods. And hidden Markov models, which apparently most of you are not very familiar with. So I'm going to try and spend a decent amount of time on that. All right. This is about patterns, and we're going to talk about patterns in DNA and protein sequences and how to find them. And, and I will say that this is a really, a continues to be a very active area in um, bioinformatics. I get problems brought to me almost every week that involve some version of finding motifs and patterns. Um, Next Gen Sequencing has increased the number of data sets with interesting patterns worth looking for rather than reduced it. It's one of those areas of informatics that, that continues to grow. So we start with simple patterns and we work our way up. Bacteria make restriction sites that cut DNA at specific base sequences. They're four to eight bases long. They're called restriction sites or restriction enzyme recognition sites. Um, mo for most enzymes, there is no variability in the site. It is exactly that set of four, six, or eight letters. And so, in theory, you can find a restriction site in a stretch of DNA with a, a simple uh, exact match of a pattern. Um, a word processor, a web browser has a find command where you could type in four or six letters and search any reasonable size block of text, you know, maybe even up to a million letters, uh, just to find the instances where your sequence matches. And you can think of reasons why that search might not work. Um, for example, if there are spaces, dashes, sometimes carriage returns interrupting the sequence, then your simple find command might not work. So to be a little bit more rigorous, you might need to sort of pre-process the sequence so that you strip out all the things that are not the letters you're looking for. Um, but in general, it's, you know, it's not stretching the capabilities of computers to look for perfect matches in relatively large blocks of sequence. Um, Naturally, there's a bunch of tools that have already been built that do this. I put this one up because these guys are in the business of selling restriction enzymes, so it made sense for them to build a tool that made it easy for people to figure out what enzymes they need to conduct a particular experiment. And it has a decent graphical interface. Um, it also shows a pattern of uh, bands that you could generate from a specific plasmid. They have a little database of common plasmids. They also have like pre-built sets of, of restriction enzymes so you could cut a particular sequence with all the enzymes in a particular set and see where those sites are and sort of design your experiment. So I'm not going to have you like rebuild this from scratch, although that might be a fun project just to say that it exists. All right, so like moving on because we have a lot to cover today and I'm not going to spend too much time on 
restriction enzyme finding except to say that it's an exact match and I'll come back to this but also a lot of the restriction sites are actually um, either direct repeats or inverted repeats and that's true for a lot of protein DNA interactions the enzyme itself obviously is a protein and a lot of DNA interacting proteins act as dimers and if it's a head-to-tail dimer then you probably have a tandem repeat of the site and if it's a head-to-head -head type dimer then you probably have an inverted repeat of the sequence and we'll get to that a little bit later on with the transcription factor sites all right gene finding is also in some sense a uh, exact match situation where you're looking for very simple patterns like start codons, ATGs, stop codons, and then some stretch of open reading, meaning uh, start codon followed by many other codons that are not stop codons, and then a stop codon. You could take it a little further and look for known uh, sequences that relate to gene expression such as the Tata box which is a promoter related sequence intron splice sites etc and then you could go a little further than that in gene finding and have some sort of a statistical analysis of each open reading frame or each chunk of DNA whether it contains codons in the preference of that particular organism. In other words, when it has the possibility of coding for a particular amino acid and it has a number of different choices, does it typically choose the three letters that are most common for that organism to use in coding sequences? And uh, generalized over hundreds of bases, this kind of coding preference is pretty accurate in finding stretches of, of DNA that do in fact code for protein and picking the correct reading frame. So you know you get a sequence like this that has some ATGs in it, some stop codons in it, and the ORF finder will spit out the coding sequence and possibly an automatic translation. Um, these gene finding programs work pretty well in bacteria because most of the bacterial genome is coding and when you find an open reading frame it is quite likely to be a real one. Um, apply a little bit of codon preference to that, um, take the longest open reading frame if they're nested and you'll have a decent gene predictor. None of these methods work very well directly on predicting eukaryotic uh, open reading frames because intron exon boundaries are relatively hard to model. There are tools that make an attempt at this, but none of them does a particularly good job at it. The only reasonable eukaryotic gene models um, have some input of known coding sequence. It might be RNA seq, ESTs, translated matches to known proteins something like that where you're adding additional information to that initial find initial search for open reading frames to say yes this particular open reading frame has uh, good coding potential or it matches an, uh, an express sequence or it matches a known protein even given that additional level of information uh, it's commonly said that 50% of human genes do not have fully correct annotation, by which they mean not the correct 5' prime UTR, not the correct 3' prime UTR, and not all the splice sites correct. Um, in fact, even the concept of a correct annotation is a little bit confusing because it's not absolutely clear that there's one and only one coding sequence for each gene. In fact, there's a range of different coding sequences and it's difficult to produce uh, an annotation that's consistent with all different data sets. You know, you, you could know that there are certain splice variants and certain um, promoter variants and certain start 
position, transcription start variants, but to figure out which combination of those variants produces the real uh, transcripts is a little bit difficult. But the goal is to take raw genome sequence, apply gene finding, apply these different levels of transcript information, splicing information, and, and come up with an annotation that you know, is useful, that lets you look at the genome and say, what is this position with respect to that gene? And how would a, uh, a binding of a factor in this position likely affect the expression of this gene? So that's, that's the goal of all of this gene finding and annotation tools. It's a sort of a combination. UCSC has a build process, but also what they do is they uh, allow you to choose whichever annotation you find most useful. I mean, if you choose the, the known to UCSC track, they're integrating data with, it's not a manual process, but they're weighting RefSeq, they're rating, weighting Ensemble, they have a few other pieces of data that they bring into the picture, and they choose their best guess, which is often very similar to the RefSeq, but not 100% of the time. So they have a track of UCSC genes. A lot of people go with the RefSeq track, which is at least to some extent manually annotated by GenBank curators. Um, if you look at the UCSC, especially for human and mouse, there are many, many other annotation tracks. A lot of them are computational, like GeneScan, which gives you very unpredictable and unreliable results. But, you know, taken all together, sort of the combination of different evidences plus your own judgment is the best you can do. The challenge, of course, is and we'll get to this later, if you're interested in, say, transcription factor, you want to look for the upstream region of a particular gene, which means you need a valid prediction of where the transcription start is in order to choose that upstream region. And depending on which annotation source you use as your ultimate reference, you might have different positions chosen as the upstream start. You might have multiple uh, positions chosen as upstream of different coding sequences that are all aggregated under the same gene symbol. And so, you know, it becomes a little bit difficult to do a definitive search for a transcription factor that's at a particular location with respect to this known gene. You know, we know there's a gene there, we know a fair bit about its protein, but it might have a transcription start here, and it might have a transcription start there. It may be that transcription factors interact differently with those two transcription starts, and that might, in fact, be a source of regulation itself. Yes? So there's a bunch of tools that offer various versions of gene finding if you have a sequence that needs gene finding. Um, all I'll say is that they, they offer various combinations of the straightforward ORF matching, the codon preference, the use of other types of data, and you'll get different results from each of these tools, and none of them is validated to be more correct than any of the others. Actually, I like the ORF finder at NCBI because it's dead simple. It just finds the ATGs. You can specify how long a read before the first stop codon should be called the real protein, and that's it. Then it gives you a translation, and it lets you explore that translation. So rather than rely on more sophisticated and difficult to validate tools, this one's very straightforward. So like I just said, there may not be a correct annotation to the gene finding problem. Any tweak that you make to your algorithm is going to favor some genes over others. And 
it's, it may be sort of a fuzzy problem because there are many valid coding sequences for some genes. Um, definitely more than one start and stop position for each gene. Alternative splicing is definitely important. Um, also, your gene finders tend to be fooled by pseudogenes. And there's a number of different kinds of pseudogenes. Some involve uh, reinsertion of RNA back into the genome, so reverse transcription and then reinsertion. Those are called intronless pseudogenes. Some of the gene finding programs have an additional step to remove all the intronless pseudogenes after it's done its first round of prediction. Um, other pseudogenes are the result of wholesale duplication of DNA followed by mutagenesis so that the particular gene picks up enough mutations that it cannot produce a valid RNA or it can't produce a valid RNA that's translatable. And that would be considered a pseudogene, although it might be expressed and might actually produce RNA in the cell, but those RNAs don't go on to produce functional proteins. So that's kind of a different definition of a pseudogene. So whether or not it's transcribed depends on your definitions. Um, so the final take home from this is computationally, computational gene predictions need to be validated experimentally. And one level of experimental validation, although not the final one, is to look at expression of RNA from those genes and the use of RNA-seq data is increasingly um, important in this type of gene finding and gene annotation. So the tools that do this are starting to incorporate you know, large-scale RNA expression data as, into the model, which is really interesting. OK, so moving on a little bit, going pretty fast. Once you've located a gene on the chromosome. Usually they call this a gene model. It means, you know, the gene is really a concept. A model is a set of positions on a particular build of the genome where that gene has its coding sequence and its upstream regions, the regulatory sequences, etc. Um, and then you can look for these regulatory sequences, which are where transcription factor binding sites are located. Um, these are proteins usually um, that bind and influence transcription. Usually we call them promoters and enhancers. They can also be inhibitors, etc. So it's a protein that interacts with the DNA and affects the transcription in a relatively local area, although there can also be transacting transcription factors that can be many thousands or even tens of thousands of bases away and may interact with the coding sequence or with the uh, RNA polymerase through some kind of a looping interaction. So the DNA folds and distant transcription factors bound to um, Binding sites that are quite far away from the traditional promoter region can bend over and come into play. That's sort of a model for how enhancers work. And the enhancer could also be downstream. It could be in, in an intron or even a three prime region and loop around and still affect the transcription of that gene. Okay, so we're going to talk about finding transcription factors. Um, this is a model I've used a lot, although it's not the easiest one to get you, to wrap your uh, head around. The yellow and red twisty thing along the bottom of the model is the DNA. The gray blobby thing and the wireframe thing are the two halves of the phage crow repressor. It's a, it's a dimer, and one half of the dimer is represented in wireframe, and the other half of the dimer is represented in this space filling. And the point of this thing is that 
This is a pretty common shape for a protein DNA interaction in terms of the si relative size of the molecules. The DNA is obviously longer. The red and yellow thing ex spiral extends in both directions, you know, for a very great distance. But this is the interaction site. And one of the important things to realize is that the, the protein is attached to one side of the DNA. And so, and it, it sort of nests into what they call the major groove. But some of the bases are on the other side of that loop. And they don't interact with the protein at all. So those bases are more or less free to change without affecting the binding interaction. Whereas those bases that are facing the side that the protein is stuck to, those are going to be the ones that are conserved. And we'll see that later in our um, sequence motifs and logos and binding factors that some bases matter more than others. And it typically follows this kind of a distribution that at the scale of three or four bases binding and then two or three that don't affect it and then two or three or four more that are important. And, and you'll see that waveform at that kind of a scale. So it's good to think about that. I mean, there are some proteins that interact with DNA wrapping around it rather than linearly, but this is a much more common type of interaction where they nest into the major groove. And very frequently, as I said, DNA binding proteins act as dimers. And so the same sequence in tandem or inverted repeat will bind to that protein. So very typically a six mer of bases separated by a few more bases will make up a transcription factor binding site. Okay, so we show, I, saw, I showed you sequence logos last time and I'm showing it again now with the idea of some of those bases are on the same side that the protein is binding and some of them are on the other side. So this is the same thing, the Crow binding site in Lambda. And as you can see, the ACC and then the inverse repeat, the GGT, are binding most tightly to the protein. And then in this facing away portion, it, there's a lot less information. So the the reality and the model match up pretty well. Um, many of these DNA regulatory sequences that interact with specific transcription factor proteins are known. And there are a number of public databases that keep track of these binding sites and their regulatory proteins. and to some extent they're annotated in terms of what's the function of the binding site, um, what gene does it regulate, obviously, the transcription factor, maybe what pathway that transcription factor is a part of. Um, I've been using JASPAR a lot lately. It has emerged as the most popular and easiest to use collection of known transcription factors. It's not fully comprehensive, but none of these data sets are. Um, but it's very useful, and it has most of the well-documented um, protein DNA interactions. It's built primarily by combing the literature. Yeah? Uh, are there multiple species? Yeah, there are multiple species. It's built mostly from model systems. So it's got a lot of human, a lot of mouse, Drosophila, some zebrafish, and then you infer other protein bindings sort of by similarity. And yeah, it could be that your species has an unusual motif for its binding, but that's not so typical. Yeah. Yeah, 
Right. That, that, in fact, that's actually a important gene finding re truth is that if you if you think you have a gene and it has a conserved binding site at an appropriate position position that's additional evidence for that gene being real and actively transcribed um, so i was just wondering with these websites you have to enter in one gene at a time or is it automated like this um it's automatable, but it's actually even easier just to download the whole data set and work with it locally on your own machine. The, the sites database, I mean, they have hundreds, maybe low thousand uh, number of sites documented in their database. So it's not a big data set to work with in an automated fashion. Um, so JASPAR is curated from the literature. All right, 593. That's how many binding sites they have. Not a huge number. Uniprobe is experimental, um, which is good and bad. I mean, the binding is sort of confirmed between a given protein and a given sequence motif. But that's an in vitro study, and it doesn't mean that it works in the real world or in a real cell. But the combination of those two is a nice set of uh, nested information. Um, TransFAC used to be the database of choice that everyone went to. Um, they went private and commercial about 10 years ago. So a lot of the tools that are based on searching TransFAC are using a database that's now 12 or 13 years old. Or you could pay for a license to TransFact, but then you can't build a tool that anyone else can use. So I'm not using it much anymore. Um, the eukaryotic promoter database, it has a lot of entries, but they are not as well curated and validated as the ones in JASPAR, so it's not used as commonly. Have you used Contact at all? How does that I don't know that one. Um, Jaspar is the one that they've plugged into the R motifs package and the Python motifs package. So that's what I've been using lately and haven't been criticized by any reviewers. So I'm going to stick with it for a while. So this is what a, ja a typical Jaspar entry looks like. So it has the name of the binding site which relates to the name of the transcription factor because many different genes could have this binding site. Um, it has a class, which is usually a, uh, a protein family, but it may also relate to a gene ontology annotation. Um, the family is kind of its own construct, a, a group of transcription factors that share certain properties. Species where this particular motif came from, um, a bunch of cross links to Medline, etc. All right, it has the sequence logo. It has a frequency matrix, which I'm going to define for you in a minute or two. And I think you can also get the matrix as a position specific weight matrix. Right. So if you think about, well, JASPAR is actually built from a multiple alignment, which is not a huge surprise, of experimentally validated binding sites on a variety of genes. In this case, when they're talking about Homo sapiens, right, then they have a set of human genes with known binding that has been in some way experimentally reported for this transcription factor presumably in the promoter or wherever it likes to be in relation to genes, and maybe even some experimental evidence that said binding has an effect on gene expression. So underlying this um, entry is a collection of sequence fragments. Um, they're sort of in alignment, although I wouldn't swear that it's in a valid alignment format, but it's, it's in a format that they call dot sites. 
which is their own made up format. But it's sort of similar to a fast, it's very similar to the fast day multiple alignment format where there ought to be the same number of bases for each entry except when there isn't. Um, and they use capital and small letters to designate the binding site versus the flanking region. But after you take this collection of binding sites and you make a multiple alignment and then you trim it to just the region in question, just the, the sequence binding region, then you can count the frequency of each of the letters. We're talking about DNA motifs here. So each of the four DNA bases exists at a certain frequency at each position in this logo. And that's what the frequency matrix says, right? So in this position under the C, there's 800 C's and 56 A's, 21 G's, and 36 T's. So there's nearly a thousand instances of binding that have been used to build this logo. It's a, a pretty strong and rich data set. Um, the C is obviously dominant at this position. At another position, you can see there's two letters. There's a, a, G, a C and a G that have nearly equal frequency, 528 and 324 at position number eight. So that tells you um, a lot about this um, logo. It tells you how it was built. But you can also use this frequency matrix to do a search. Uh, we talked about a position-specific scoring matrix. This is a version of a position-specific scoring matrix based on the frequency of each letter at each position. Um, so the simplest version that we just looked at is what they call the count matrix. How many times that letter appears at that position, in the, at that column of the alignment. Um, this can be normalized to because obviously if you want to compare count matrices for different motifs that are built with different number of instances then you know a sum of 870 isn't a particularly useful value so if you sum them all to one right and then divide you say well what percentage of all of the instances are a g what percentage are a t and those things sum to one. Not, well, you know what I mean. So that's what a normalized position weight matrix is, where you're just saying, um, what's the fraction of the instances in the count matrix represented by each of the four letters? When you see a count matrix, sometimes, although this one doesn't have it, sometimes you'll see zeros. Um, that's much more common in a logo that you make yourself where you have a relatively small number of instances, you know, 20, 30 maybe, binding sites. And in those sites, at a particular highly conserved position, you see zero Ts at one particular spot. You know, it's almost always a G, and a couple of times you see an A, and maybe once there was a T, but there's zero Gs in that spot. And so your matrix has a zero. That's um, when you take it to the next step, you take it to a log odds ratio, that zero becomes negative infinity, which is the chance that you'll see a G there in a correctly bound motif. And that's a bad number, negative infinity, to, to work with in a lot of simple equations. But it also doesn't represent the biological reality, right? It's not infinitely impossible for a G to occur at that position. You simply haven't observed it in the limited data set that you used for your multiple alignment to build this motif. So you replace that zero with a small number called a pseudo count. And that mo I concept of using pseudo counts pops up fairly often in informatics. So it's a good word to, to wrap your head around. A false count 
of a low number. And how you choose that pseudo count is actually not really important. It's a small number. It should be maybe as small as the smallest number in your matrix. Or, you know, when we're, when we're using fractions, maybe a 0.01 would be a good number. Or if you had 800 instances in your alignment, then, you know, maybe one of those 800 would be the pseudo count. So, you know, one divided by 800 would be a good number to use. It doesn't actually matter as long as the pseudo count is quite small. And all it's doing is it's saying that pseudo count is standing in for unobserved, rare situations where the actual base differs from the consensus base at that position. And you might insist that it's absolutely required to have this letter at this position, but I can tell you from a mathematical point of view, your matrix will work better if you don't have zeros in it. All right, so I didn't, yeah. Yeah, about to get to that. <laughs> okay, so those are the log odd scores. All right, um, the, the position weight matrix is simply the fraction of observed frequencies, you know, just normalized so that they all add to one. And then this is a log odd score, meaning what's the likelihood that you would observe such a letter in a matching sequence? And the log odd score um, is kind of related to the information content, so they don't all have to add up to the same value. But what you'll see when the log odd score is, you know, it's the ratio of the basically the match to the best or most frequent letter compared to the match of any other letter, log the base two of that ratio. What happens is you get a positive value for the letter which corresponds to the most frequent um, normalized score, and you get negative values for those letters that correspond to letters that are not frequent in your scoring matrix. It's very, very similar to a scoring table like we used for PAM or Blossom or any other lookup matrix. And you can use those log odd scores to do an alignment. In other words, you can take any sequence, slide it along the scoring matrix, and give a score for each letter out of this table. And you know, so in the first position here, if you have an A, you get a negative score. If you have a C, you get a positive score. If you have a G, you get a worse negative score. And if you have a T, you get a bad negative score also. So that means, obviously, that only a C in this position gives you a good match to your scoring matrix, gives you a good match to this motif. Yeah. Yes and no. I mean, you can slide this matrix along a whole genome and get the scores for every possible position, but the problem is there's a lot of false positive matches. I mean, look, how, look at the size of this matrix, right? It's only five or six letters wide. So you can, you have a, the, there's a maximum score for this matrix, which represents a, a sequence which has the, the consensus, the most frequent letter at each position. So what's the chance that that's going to occur in a whole genome randomly? Lots of times, right? So it's not that helpful to have a whole genome score for a particular matrix. Usually we limit, we try and limit the data that we search with a particular matrix as tightly as we can. I mean, if you know that it's a five prime promoter type of a binding factor, it likes to bind just upstream of the transcription start, then you try and look at just the upstream sequences for a group of genes of interest. And for each of those upstream sequences, you slide the matrix and you get a best score, hopefully, 
for the upstream sequence of each gene and then you compare those best scores and that gives you a, a feeling for how well the matrix matches this set of genes. You will need controls, which I'm getting to, because again, you have false positives when you work with a relatively small amount of information like this. I just wanted to talk about how the scores were computed, then we'll talk about how we use the scores. So I think I pretty much covered the idea here. You use the position specific scoring matrix to give a score for every letter and the sum of those scores is the score of that position and then you slide over one, rescore, slide over one, rescore for as long a sequence as you want to test. Um, yeah. Equal? Um, you'll have equal probable ones. You know, you'll have two positive scores. No, you can't have two positive scores. Um, actually, it's relatively difficult, right? Because the log odds have to be greater than 0.5 to get a positive score. So I guess you'd have two scores that are very close to zero. which is just a weakness of this scoring system. But yeah, there isn't a, a, if you had two that are very similar, then there's not a consensus at that position. Yeah. Well, it's, it's the log ratio of the frequency at this position compared to an equal score, you know, 25, 25, 25. So, if, if your frequency is higher than 0.25, then you should have a, a positive score. And if it's lower, it should be a negative score. Yeah. The position weight matrix should add to one, yeah. The position scoring matrix, no. It's probably a typo. Yeah, that's definitely the way it works because there's a rounding error. It's not a typo. Is it because it's a pseudo count that that happens? No, it's a more of a rounding error. I, I only used two, um, uh, I mean, because I wanted it to fit, you know. The actual scoring matrix has a longer decimal than just two. But yeah, it's a rounding error. And it should add to one or 0.9999. Yeah. So again, that's an interesting point about how it's computed because you're making the assumption of equal scoring matrix, you know, G, A, T, and C all at 0.25%. And you could e equally well compute that at a different G, C to A, T ratio if you wanted to. So like human genome is a little more G, C rich. It's about 60% G, C. So you could compare the log odd ratio against a 0.6 to 0.4 mix just as easily. And that's actually, there's a Python command for it in the motif package to change the position scoring matrix based on the weight matrix and a different genomic background. Don't think it makes any difference eventually once you start comparing to controls but it does give you different scores for each base as you slide the matrix along. Don't know if it makes it more specific or not, but it gives you different scores. Okay, so going back to the start, there are motif searching methods based on each of the things that I described. And actually, I didn't get to the regular expressions yet. That's coming ne next. So for like the restriction sites, you can do an exact match. And Python has this match, has this count function, which will do exact matches for you. If you count the number of times that this little string occurs in a larger string, those are exact match counts with no uh, variability at all. I need to talk about regular expressions in another couple slides, so I'll 
do that and then come back here. But a regular expression is a match that has some variability in it. Some positions are allowed to be different, but you specify exactly what differences are allowed. And then we have this position specific scoring matrix search, PSSM search, which has this nice um, Python function called PSSM search. Um, and it works with a set of motifs that are either entered as a multiple alignment or as a count matrix. And then it automatically count calculates the position weight matrix and it automatically calculates the scoring matrix. If you don't give it a background, it assumes equal 25, 25, 25 background, or you could give it a different background. You can also insert your own pseudo count into the weight matrix. So all of that's built into this PSSM search function. Um, typically, you, you do it inside of a loop like this because you want to search through a number of sequences, but you can just do a PSSM search on one sequence and it'll give you a result for the location and the score of the best match in that sequence. So position zero has a score of five, position minus 20 has, oh, PSSM search is also um, strand aware. You don't have to search the reverse complement. It automatically searches the reverse complement and gives them as negative positions. All the positions start at zero and go to the end of the string you're searching. The negative positions represent matches on the reverse complement. So you don't have to bother doing reverse complement and then searching again. Position 10, position 13. So, oh, and it get, you, you, you give it a threshold. That's a log odds score threshold. So a log odds score of 7 is 100 times more likely to occur in a motif than in a random background. Now those are the positions that have matches above the threshold of the log odds. So it's, you could get it to print out the score for every position in your sequence. It will happily do that. You just give it a threshold of zero. But that's a lot of data to churn through when it can automatically filter down your matches to just the best ones. It doesn't automatically filter down to just the best match for each sequence you have to give it a threshold. If you set your threshold wisely, then only good matches to your motif will be present, and it will give you zero scores or zero matches to those sequences that don't have a good match to your search motif. And The first letter of your motif will be at position 20, but on the inverse complement. But it's still at position 20. But I guess it's being read in the opposite way. Yeah, so if you're thinking about a transcription factor, then you might expect that it only matches one time. But there are plenty of transcription factors that have multiple binding sites in the promoter of a particular gene. So my little statement to match one or zero times is probably not so correct. I mean, you could easily have two completely valid matches in the upstream sequence of one gene for a particular transcription factor binding site. Um, all right, now we're going to talk about controls and validation. The Transcription factor binding sites in the databases lack information. Mostly they're short. They could be really short, like four or five letters. The good ones are six letters separated by a couple. That's sort of typical. 
that represents most likely one of those dimer transcription factors. Um, but even there, if you do the math, uh, a 12-letter motif, and you're not binding, you're not specifying that motif rigorously, there's some wobble there, that will show up many times at random in the genome or in the upstream region of all the genes in the genome. If you took 2,000 bases upstream for 25,000 genes, you're very likely to get some false positive matches that have very high log odd scores, even perfect scores. In other words, they have the, the sequence that matches best to your scoring matrix. Uh, it's a variable sequence. It's a consensus. It's not enough information for proteins to locate unique promoters for each gene in 3 billion bases. Um, the biological truth is probably that while transcription factors do bind to those sequences, and we can prove that by um, ChIP-seq, you know, fusions of the protein cross-linking and antibody pull-down experiments, yeast-2 hybrid, et cetera, et cetera, they do bind there, but the information of those binding bases is not the only information that's being used. Most of the time, transcription factors bind cooperatively and combinatorially. In other, way, in other words, that binding is stabilized by other factors that are bound in that neighborhood of the DNA. And that information is not captured by direct protein DNA interaction. It's a combination of protein protein and protein DNA binding that all sort of works, like I said, cooperatively and in a combinatorial fashion. Um, it's also possible to use phylogenetic conservation to help predict binding sites. So a binding site that's in the same location with respect to the coding sequence of a gene across multiple species is more likely to be real. So, okay, so I'm actually, I need to talk a little bit more about controls, and I didn't put a slide up about this, or at least not right here. But, so you have your scoring matrix, you have a set of sequences that you want to test, you have a log odds score, which is really just how well does this sequence match the consensus sequence of my motif, right? The question you need to ask is, how well does a random sequence, or how well does my scoring matrix match an equal sized random sequence? And random is actually very hard to define, and informatics people have been struggling with this for a while, and I'm still working on it. But there's many different ways to pick a random sequence. One way would be to take the sequences that you have and scramble them up randomly, you know, letter by letter. Just throw them in a pile and pull from that pile and rebuild new sequences, in which case you would have the exact same GATC composition of your letters. And you'd have the same length of sequence as well. That's a reasonable version of a, of a control, is a scrambled sequence. Another version would just draw from, use the random sequence generator, um, use the GC composition, GATC composition of your original sequences or of your genome as the background and draw at that level and create a similar size chunk of sequence and match to that. Another scarier way of doing this would be to draw upstream sequence from other genes that are not on your list of genes that you're interested in. You know, you're, you're, you have a list of genes and you're looking for this, promote, this motif, whether it binds to the promoter region of your list of, you know, regu potentially regulated genes or chip seek pull down genes or whatever. You could draw randomly from the genome, other genes, 
exclusive of the genes on your list and see how well this transcription factor binds to the upstream region of those other genes. Now that would be an interesting control, but if you had good matches, it would be inconclusive. So I've tried all three of those approaches. I think the scramble seek is probably the safest. Scrambled and random should be the same, but somehow they're not. Don't know why. Okay, so these are some web-based tools that do the type of search that I was just talking about. Um, most of them using that log odds score that I was just describing. Yes? No? Um, I've used the RSAT, the JASPAR, the TF search. Promoter scan and signal scan both run on your own computer as well as on the web. Um, these things tend to change with some frequency on the web, so you have to go out there and search what's available today. Um, I don't know why it's such a dynamic area, but people pop up their web servers, they function for a few years, they get cross-linked widely to other sites, and then they disappear. So the RSAT works today, JASPAR works today. Most of these others worked in the summer when I made this web page. Okay, I'm going to talk really briefly about protein sequences, not because I'm going to teach you how to dynamically design three-dimensional proteins, but because we want to look at motifs that, have, that are found in proteins. And it's helpful to visualize and to some extent the relationship between a protein sequence as amino acid letters in a FASTA file versus a three-dimensional protein existing in you know, cellular space. So when you have a protein sequence, there's certain properties that are implicit that you can easily calculate and then others that are true but hard to computationally um, calculate. So there are some simple properties of the overall molecule that are just the sum of the properties of the individual amino acids. Stuff like molecular weight, pH, isoelectric point, and hydrophobicity. Um, actually hydrophobicity is more of a window-based property. It's much more interesting to study the hydrophobicity in groups of 10 amino acids sliding along the protein rather than the overall hydrophobicity of the whole protein because the protein can have hydrophobic and hydrophilic regions and it's really you learn a lot more by graphing than you do by just taking the, the jumbled overall hydrophobicity. Then there are specific sort of functional motifs that are strictly a property of either a specific group of sequences or more likely the combination of hydrophilic and hydrophobic residues. So these things are predicted pretty easily with relatively simple algorithms. And those are things like signal peptides, coiled coil, and transmembrane domains. So like a, a, a TM predictor doesn't need an enormous database. It just scans a protein and looks for uh, a window of hydrophobic residues surrounded by hydrophilic. And so that's a fairly easy thing to program. Then we have protein families, which I'm going to talk about in great depth. Um, secondary structure, again, it's more a function of hydrophilic and hydrophobic bases and how they're interspersed to determine whether a particular stretch is helix forming or non-helix forming, whether it's a loop or a beta sheet. So those are also simple properties that don't involve a lot of higher math. And then 3D uh, structure prediction does involve a lot of higher math and it's by no means a solved problem. So we're going to touch on that very briefly today. It would really be, it really does represent
what, another course or a whole sequence of courses to really get a grip on 3D structure. Okay, so proteins are linear polymers of the 20 amino acids. The chemical properties of the overall protein are obviously determined by its amino acids. The molecular weight, pH, isoelectric point are overall determined by the amino acid composition. Hydrophobicity is best examined as a graph. So there's this thing called a, a kite doolittle plot, which is just a graph of the aggregate hydrophobicity of a small sliding window. In this case, we're using a window of 19. Um, this particular tool allows you to adjust the window size, but this one is probably optimal for predicting transmembrane regions. So when you get a spike in the, hydrophil the hydrophilicity, so this is a, well, a hydrophobic region would be a transmembrane region. So this might have potentially one, two, three transmembrane regions, maybe. Yep. Um, charge, basically. Well, not charge, hydrophobic. And I don't know how they calculate what zero is in a hydrophobic versus hydrophilic. All I know is that in this particular graph, up is hydrophilic and down is hydrophobic. I could study it up for you, but it's not so important right this second. So there's a bunch of websites that will do this for you. There's also emboss tools. This is an emboss um, graph that I made here that will do this. And emboss, like I said, is downloadable and there's also several sites that have web interfaces to the emboss tools. So statistical analysis, hydrophobic, transmembrane, etc. cetera. Um, oh, so here's a list of some of my favorite emboss tools for protein analysis. Open reading frame finder, secondary structure, plot charge, plot hydrophobicity, um, protein secondary structure and hydrophobicity, transmembrane regions, etc. Um, so there's some of these additional fairly simple structural motifs that can easily be predicted. Membrane spanning, signal peptides, coiled coils, and helix turn helix. So signal peptides are 20 to 25 amino acid tags at the five prime end of proteins. They're, they're at the beginning because as the protein is synthesized, the tag is the first thing that sticks out of the ribosome and the transport um, protein, the, in this case they're calling it signal rep recognition particle, recognizes that thing, latches on, and begins to transport it even before the protein is finished being synthesized by the ribosome. So that's a fairly simple. The signal sequences can be recognized by sequence identity, basically. There's a small database of these known sequence motifs, um, and they are specific for specific subcellular compartments. So there's a tool that has a set of these known sequence motifs and just searches proteins for them. Um, it is a very nice way of figuring out whether your particular protein is excreted or making a list of, of proteins that are excreted from a particular uh, cell, organism, etc which could be very important if it's, say, a toxin-producing bacteria or something along those lines. Also, you can sort for those proteins that go to the mitochondria, those that go to various other subcellular compartments. So there's specific signals for each of those, and those are recognized by their sequence. And there's a bunch of software that is pre-designed for doing each of these various subcellular compartments, chloroplasts, lipoproteins, mitochondrial proteins, um, peroxisome, et cetera, signal peptide cleavage site. So those things, the signal peptides are chopped off 
at some point in the post-translational processing of the protein. Um, then there's another set of structures that are commonly called supersecondary structures. Um, membrane spanning, coil coil, helix turned helix that are predicted from the abundance of specific amino acids in a window and the pattern of hydrophobic hydrophilic. And um, I won't get into this too thoroughly, but I'd say that transmembrane prediction is pretty accurate. And coil coil, a little less so, signal peptide, very accurate, that's been well studied. And you can do these in bulk, you can process an entire genome's worth of predicted proteins and find all the ones that are transmembrane, all the ones that have coil coil, all the ones that have signal peptides, um, and be reasonably sure about that if, that, if you need to characterize the proteome of your samples of cells. Okay, getting a little bit more abstract. Proteins are built out of functional units known as domains or motifs. And these domains are defined by their conserved sequences. Um, there's some notion that exons correspond to domains, and there's sort of an equal amount of evidence that some domains have introns in the middle of them and others don't. So it's an interesting notion. It lends this idea of splicing together new proteins from functional domains of existing proteins, and you definitely see some evidence of that, but that's, again, it's not always the case. Again, you may see a situation where proteins that are otherwise unrelated share one highly conserved motif, such as a DNA binding domain or a kinase domain or a phosphorylase domain or something along those lines, acetylase. So it can be true that you can cut and splice an entire functional domain from one protein to another and create a protein with a new combination of features and powers. So given this notion that we have a database of these functional domains, you can characterize the proteins in a large database such as SwissProt according to their domain structure. And there's uh, several databases. ProDom is probably the one that has the nicest graphics that does just that. It says, okay, so here's the green domain, and here's a list of all the proteins that have that green domain. To, that green domain in this case is a P-loop containing triphosphate hydrolase. And then it also, a lot of those green ones also have this uh, ETF blue domain, and there's these two proteins. And then this one is a little different. It also has this elongation factor domain tacked on. And so you can sort your proteins according to the shared domains that they have. And so it's an, it's an interesting notion. I won't go too much beyond that right now. All right. How do we define these protein motifs? And again, we get back to multiple alignment of similar proteins. In this case, it could be similar proteins from different species or a group of proteins that form a family. They all share a particular common um, domain or motif, like I said, a kinase or whatever these are, hydrolase, elongation factor, initiation factor, etc. <coughs> so you build a multiple alignment of proteins that you know share this feature. You trim down that alignment to focus just on that conserved region. Now you look at the columns of the alignment and once again, you can represent those columns as a scoring matrix. The frequency of each of the different amino acids in that position. Once again, we'll have the situation where our sample is limited, our sample size. We don't have every possible 
uh, instance of this motif from every protein in every organism. So the fact that there are zeros, there are lots of amino acids that are not represented in this column, doesn't mean that we should give our scoring matrix and our weight matrix a negative infinite score. We should probably put in some kind of a pseudo count here. In the protein world, we have something better than just choosing an arbitrary number. We already have a blossom or a PAM matrix where we know the background replacement likelihood of every amino acid with every other amino acid in conserved domains. That's the whole, that's how these uh, replacement matrices are built, these scoring matrices. So for the positions that, for the amino acids that are not present in a given column, and we can't assign a score based on their relative frequency in that column, we can pull a score from the appropriate Blossom or PAM matrix and insert that there um, as a position weight score. Alternately, and a little bit simpler, and I'm kind of getting ahead of myself, there's this notion of a pattern which represents the exact most common letter at each position in the conserved motif. And for those columns where there's more than one letter, you can actually represent all the options inside like this set of square brackets. So in this position here, it's very highly conserved, but in addition to the F, we also see a Y and an L. So in this case, FYL is defined as a match in this first position of this pattern. Then there's an X, meaning there's very little information at the next position, and we're not going to specify any amino acid there. The next, position, the next position has any of LIVMC, the next position K or R, the next position W is absolutely conserved. So only motifs with the W in that position are allowed. And you can go on for as many letters as you have solid information. And this whole thing together is called a pattern. And you could use this pattern in what's called a regular expression match, which is sort of like an exact match with a find command, but it's an exact match that allows for the specified variations. So it'll match anything that has exactly this set of letters in it. Right. Yeah, I don't have a, a good definition of how regular expressions work better than this. But there, a while back, uh, a database called ProSite was built using exactly this method. And a relatively small set of really well understood protein functional domains. And each one of those domains and all the proteins that contained a, an instance of that domain were called a family. And so the whole thing together, the ProSite database has, is, is built of protein families. And each one of those uh, ProSite motifs or patterns had a curator, an expert scientist who was in charge of designing that um, that pattern to match all the known instances of that protein. So if somebody discovered a new protein in a new organism that had the functionality, you know, it, it, they assayed it biochemically and it did the thing that the proteins in those families have and it had a matching sequence but one letter didn't match the pattern then the pattern would be adjusted so that it would include that new instance. So obviously a sort of painstaking manual process to document all the possible variations. And it always has the problem of 
not including very similar but not matching sequences. Regular expression matches are always just yes or no. They don't have a log odd score. They simply match the pattern as defined with all of the allowed variations or they fail to match that pattern because you have a variation outside of the list of allowed variants. Um, okay, so this is the ProSite database maintained by Amos Baruch at the University of Geneva in Switzerland. Um, and another problem with matching to a pattern is there's no way to do gaps. The pattern match is exact. I mean, you could define a gap as a space in the pattern of a certain variable number of x's, but only in that position. If a gap occurred in a place where you didn't predefine it in your regular expression, then you don't have a gap search. When you do a profile alignment, there's a relatively easy way to define gaps just going back to the Smith-Waterman, right? So you give a penalty for adding a gap and then you continue on adding your log odd scores. So it's the sum of log odd scores minus any gaps in the alignment that occurred. Right, so it does not allow variations on the theme. It only allows existing documented variants to the exact pattern. And some more instances of patterns. Zinc finger has a pattern. It's a crazy pattern because there's only a few positions in the protein that are conserved and all the others are X's, meaning anything could be there. Yet you can actually find zinc fingers in lots of real proteins and they all, to as far as I know, a, they all have this functionality. This zinc finger really works. It's a, it's a binding domain. So it's a very loose pattern. It has a lot of matches, but it still has, is still powerful. Um, these are some tools that allow you to do exact pattern matching. FuzzNuke, FuzzPro, PREG are all in emboss. And they're all still used to uh, a fairly good extent in, in bioinformatics work. Okay. So, as you could imagine, if we have a set of known sequences that contain a given motif in order to build a pattern in ProSite, we can go back and build a position specific scoring matrix for that same pattern and then do a position specific scoring matrix search instead of a regular expression search. So exact matches, fuzzy matches, regular expression pattern matches, scores for each type of match in each position with a position specific scoring matrix. And then we're going to talk about one more sophisticated type of matching called the hidden Markov match, hidden Markov model match. Okay. Um, profiles are tables of amino acid frequencies. They're built from the multiple alignments. ProSite has such tables and they have a profile alignment tool that does pretty much the exact same thing as the PSSM search tool that I showed you um, in Python. In fact, that PSSM search tool will work perfectly well with a protein matrix instead of a DNA matrix. So this is a protein PSSM. Obviously, with 20 columns, it gets to be a much larger matrix with a lot more values in it, but it has the same function. Um, there are a number of tools that will do protein-based alignments with the PSSM for a protein. It, you can allow for gap penalties. Um, you can do optimal alignments using essentially the Smith-Waterman method. Oops. So you can use this method, and I talked about this last week when we were talking about Clustal, to add a new sequence to an existing multiple alignment. So 
when you have a multiple alignment built in any way that you choose, implicitly, there's always a position specific scoring matrix associated with that multiple alignment. And Clustal holds that in memory. And you can use that to add another sequence to your multiple alignment, which is what Clustal does step by step anyway, right? It, it counts the frequency of each base or each amino acid in each position, gives it a frequency score, and then uses that score to, to match a new sequence. If you're working with just a motif, you could slide the, mo the sequence along the motif or slide the motif along the sequence and, and find the position with the optimal score, given a penalty as well. You can also search with that motif against an entire database of sequences, looking for any sequence that contains an instance of a good match to that pattern. So you slide the sequence, the motif, sequentially along all sequences, giving some threshold for a good match or an E value where you say this match is much more likely to occur than by chance. Um, alternately, and this is really a very commonly used tool, is if you have an unknown sequence, you can test that sequence against an entire database of known motifs for all the protein functional domains and see if any of those functional domains are in your protein. This is a situation where a database like ProSite, which has very well annotated functional domains that have domain experts and possibly some biochemistry associated with them is really valuable because when you find a match in your pro unknown protein, that match is now worth more in terms of annotating the function of your unknown protein. It has such and such a domain and this domain is an acetylase or this domain is a protease or this domain is DNA binding or this domain is a protein-protein interaction domain, etc. Whereas if you have a bunch of computationally produced motifs that don't have functions assigned to them, matching such a motif is not nearly as helpful. So PFSCAN is really a useful tool to take your sequence and scan it against all the motifs in the database, sliding them along and looking again for a match that's better than chance, right? A high PE value match. And you can also use profile alignment to compare two different motifs to each other, which is, you know, has a, is occasionally useful. All right, so there's simple profile analysis tools in Emboss, and I'm also going to look at the very same tools in a toolkit called Himmer. So from your multiple alignment, you can create a profile. Obviously, you can score the frequency of each amino acid and then compute the position specific scoring matrix from that, uh, from those columns of frequencies. Profit is a tool to scan an entire database with your profile. And the other one, Profit makes pairwise alignments between a single sequence and a profile. And you could use this to take one sequence and scan it against every uh, profile. Oh no, or scan. Yeah, or scan one profile against every sequence in a big set of sequences. Say the set of ChIP-seq matching uh, pro sequences that you've pulled down in an antibody experiment. And here's some tools that would allow you to profile search. So these are databases that contain profiles and you would take a single sequence or a bunch of sequences and scan them against these profiles. Um, PFAM I'm going to focus on a little bit more because this is a sort of a second generation protein motif database. Um, I, I mentioned ProDOM before that it has this nice graphical feature that it allows you to group all the sequences, say, in SwissProt according to their existence of a particular domain. 
and then it shows you what other domains are in those proteins as well. A um, little bit of an aside, but when you do a BLAST search, the matches are typically looked up in a standard database like Blossom, right? So you have an alliance, you have a position, your sequence has a protein letter, um, the database sequence has a protein letter, they're not exactly the same. You look up in a Blossom matrix and you say, how good are those, how similar are those amino acids to each other? in evolutionary terms. How often does a valine get replaced by an isoleucine? Um, really often, okay, we give it a positive score. How often does a tyrosine replace an alanine? Not very often, we give it a negative score. You can use BLAST and build dynamically a new scoring matrix. So the way it's typically done is you do a BLAST, a standard protein BLAST, and you get a bunch of matches. You take all those matches and you build a new scoring matrix just out of those sequences that match your query. This is now a newly defined protein family based on homology or similarity to a query that you put in. Presumably your query is meaningful in some way. This new scoring matrix, which you just built by counting the frequencies of letters in each position in comparison with the optimal alignment with your query. This is a new scoring matrix that is now uniquely sensitive for additional proteins that are similar to the query but didn't match very well on your first go. So now you do what's called a second round iterative and in the second round, instead of using your query sequence as the query, you use the scoring matrix that you built from all of the similar sequences. And this has the power to pull in more distant matches, variations on a theme. Because now it's not just the blossom score of one particular amino acid that you used in your query sequence. Now you're using the frequency weight matrix of all of the matching letters from all of the homologous sequences that you found in your first BLAST search. This whole complicated thing is called PSI BLAST or PSI BLAST and it works automatically in the NCBI BLAST tool if you just check off the PSI BLAST um, checkbox when you do a protein search. It only works for proteins because families are really only meaningful in a protein-based search and that scoring matrix that you built really only has good power against proteins. It's an interesting way of finding new variants on a somewhat loosely defined new protein family or new functional domain that you're interested in. And it's also good if you're trying to study functionality in a new genome which is very removed, very distant from well-defined model systems. And so in other words, you're looking for a bunch of distant matches. And so you take something, you try and do a match, and then you go back into that genome with a more broadly defined matching profile to look for other variations on that same theme. So that's Cyblast using a custom defined matrix to do a BLAST search rather than using the standard scoring matrix. All right, we're going to talk about hidden Markov models. I'm way over time, but I need to get this done because, well, I just do. <laughs> um, and I only have about six more slides. A hidden Markov model is a probabilistic way of scoring a match rather than um, an alignment-based log-odd scoring way. Um, define terms. A Markov chain is a sequence of things. The probability of each thing depending, the probability of each next thing in the chain depends on the current thing or state. 
And this is a, an abstraction of a concept called a finite state automata. In other words, you, get a, you have an existing state of your computer, something happens, and now you have a new state. The next state that the computer is about to come into only depends on the current state and some set of rules. Doesn't matter anything that happened before. Um, a hidden Markov model means that the sequence of states that form the chain are not observable. You only see the product of the choice. So you have to infer what's the rule that causes the string to go from A to W to V. The, the rules themselves are hidden. The observable characters have emission probabilities which depend on the current state. So you can use a hidden Markov model as a more sophisticated form of profile analysis. The, the chain is essentially the scoring matrix that you use, but it has more rules than the ones that we use that just look at frequencies of letters. Um, there's free software to do this called HIMR. And HMMs are actually used for a very wide range of bioinformatics problems, not just for alignments to motifs. So if you model this system where this is a four letter, say, amino acid, and there's something that is a starting state, which may or may not be important here, the very first amino acid has some probability of change to the next one, the next one. And that probability represents a, what they call a transition. So all the possible transitions represent all the possible pairs of amino acids plus the possibility of an insertion or the possibility of a deletion. So the gap penalties are sort of incorporated into the model, both gapping the sequence that you're working with, which would be an insertion, or gapping the sequence that you're aligning it to, which would be a deletion. The, the net set of all of these possible transitions is, is the model. And mathematically, it's quite big because it's 20, amino, 20 times 20 possible amino acid transitions plus the possibility of a gap plus the possibility of a deletion. So there's actually quite a lot of information that's modeled here. All right, and then you get to the next amino acid, and it has a set of probabilities of transition to the next one in the chain and the next one. So this whole set of transition models um, is, well, is saved as a model. And then that model itself can then be given a log odd score to match a new sequence. Um, and so it now basically says, given a new sequence, what's the chance that this sequence could be created by this model? You know, so what's the chance that the first letter in the sequence can be M1? And then what's the chance, if it is, then what's the chance that the next letter in the sequence could be M2? And what's the chance that the next letter in this sequence could be M3, et cetera? And the sum of all those probabilities represents how well does this sequence match the model. And then just like any other scoring system, you slide over one and you repeat. How well does the second letter in this amino acid sequence match the model? The third, the, 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 the. So for every possible frame of alignment, you get a score for how well your sequence matches this fairly complex model. Um, same idea, nicer colors. Um, again, there's this notion of a, a start, which may or may not be valid for the type of uh, model that you're using. And there's this notion of an end, where there could be something tacked on the end or not. So. I know it's a little bit 
fuzzy and confusing to work with now, but the overall notion is that um, instead of looking at frequencies of a single letter at a single position, it's modeling pairs of amino acids and the gaps are included in the model rather than being assigned as gap penalties that are sort of tacked on to the end of the alignment software. And this notion of a complex model can be applied to many things, not just to um, multiple alignments of proteins or DNA sequences. Just about any complex um, object can be modeled with an HMM. Okay, so the, the PFAM is a public database that builds HMMs. They started by taking all the motifs in ProSite and building an HMM for each one of those profiles. Then they went and they did some aggregation of uh, SwissProt, finding sequences that shared regions of similarity but weren't yet defined by an existing model, and they built some models for those as well. Those are called PFAM2 models. Um, when you have a, a test sequence, you search it against the whole PFAM database. You typically search against the PFAM1s first, the known proteins that have defined functions, and then if you don't get good matches there, you could extend your search to look at the PFAM2s. Does it have a conserved motif of unknown function? Um, while the matching is done using this hidden Markov model approach, conceptually it's almost identical to doing a profile-based search, but it's more sensitive. And in fact, doing a PFAM search is now a standard uh, approach for any protein or protein coding sequence that's submitted to GemBank. They, you know, it does it, in other words, does this novel protein contain a known motif? And searching against PFAM is considered the most sensitive way of asking that question. Okay, last thing, I'm really going to wrap up. All right, we've talked about defining motifs from multiple alignments, from functional regions that have well-defined function, biochemically defined, chip seek defined, or in some other way, you, you know that this particular region has a, a known function. What if you have a group of sequences and you suspect they share a motif, but you don't know what that motif is, and the sequences don't necessarily align? Let's say they're 1KB upstream regions or their 200 base um, next-gen seq output that have been generated from a chip seq. They won't align if they only share 6 or 12 bases of conserved binding site, which can appear anywhere in that sequence, right? They don't all have to be in the center of the, the sequence. So there's tools for finding a shared motif in unknown, unaligned sequences. Um, uh, the most commonly used tool is called MEME. And another one that is uh, also fairly popular is called Gibbs Sampler. I'm not going to go into the details of how these things work, but I, I usually summarize it as finding the lowest common denominator. In other words, if you took every chunk of every sequence in your data set and compared it with every other sequence, do, do they all share a similar match? What sequence is the most common among all the sequences that you submitted? And it takes, it takes chunks of various sizes, usually starting big and working down to small, and it reports the best match that it, it found and whether such a match is more frequent than would be expected by chance. That last bit is very dicey indeed for lots and lots of reasons that I won't get into now, but 
I think any group of sequences will share a motif that's more common than just by chance. That's just the way it seems to work. So the output of a meme or a Gibbs sampler is subject to your validation. Does it make sense? Does that same motif occur at similar frequencies in a random or control data set elsewhere on the genome, et cetera, et cetera? So um, I'm not going to go through all these details, but it's here in the PowerPoint, or you could look it up on the MEME website. Um, there's a limit to the amount of sequence data that you could submit to the web-based MEME server. We have a copy of MEME running on the Chibi cluster that will take much larger data sets, but it could inf the computation could in fact get out of hand and you know, run for a nearly unlimited amount of time. So it's not reasonable probably to search with MEME for a conserved sequence among hundreds of thousands of sequence chunks or whole genomes. You probably need to limit your set of sequences that share a conserved motif to some reasonably sized data set. Okay. So, summary. Restriction sites, simple patterns. You look for them with a perfect match count type search. Um, you can use such approaches to find genes. Regulatory sites in DNA can be defined either as patterns that have variable positions that have defined variants, which you could search by regular expression. You could look for um, protein signals using position-specific scoring matrices and hidden Markov models. So that's my summary, and next lecture is phylogenetics. And sorry to run so late.